Morning. Hi, uh, my name's Lee Brotherston. Uh, this is my talk, Corporation in the Middle. Um, by day, I'm a security advisor at Leviathan Security, and at night, I annoy my ISP by doing this sort of stuff. Um, just a quick caveat at the beginning, the data I show is about Rogers. This isn't meant specifically as a dig at them, but they're my ISP, so that's the data I've got. This probably occurs elsewhere. And for, uh, for you to understand if it's relevant to you, as you'll see in a minute, this actually occurs across a number of ISPs. Um, and is really similar to some techniques um, outlined in some of the Snowden documents and in the FinFly uh, spyware that Gamma International use. So man in the middle versus everything else is kind of different from re for researching insofar as normally you would have an IP address, an application or something like that that you're specifically attacking. Man in the middle you don't have that luxury of a specific target you pass data between two points that you own, and you just have to um, observe what's happening in the middle and make inferences from what's changing in between. Although that's kind of legally fun too, because as you're not sending data to anyone but yourself, you can send anything you like. Detection-wise, well, we'll come to detecting it if you're looking for it specifically in a minute. But if you're not looking specifically, there are, there are three broad ways in which you might detect a man-in-the-middle attack against yourself. The first is this. Uh, everyone's probably seen that at some point. You're using an SSL connection, and the browser sees the crypto break. So any application that's using crypto will probably pick up man in the middle because it messes with either signatures or the algorithms in some way. Variation on this is um, just straight up protocols breaking because data they were not expecting appeared. Um, changes in data mean that unexpected consequences happen, and you get weird errors. The third one is the what I call Spidey Sense, or Rogers injected a great big banner at the top of my web page. <laughs> this one's pretty easy to spot why. Um, it happens because I've gone over my bandwidth usage. Yes, I've upgraded my bandwidth since. Um, and there's two things to really note about this beyond the fact that there's a banner at the top. Uh, the first thing is that the URL is actually still intact. It hasn't changed. And the second thing is that the content that I originally tried to load still loaded at the bottom. They're both really important to how this works, so bear them in mind as we go through on this. Um, so when this happened, my reaction was something like this. And, and, then, and then I sat down and thought about it a little. And I wanted to know how and why and, and, and sort of learn what was happening. Uh, my initial guess was maybe they were spoofing DNS. They put me in some kind of captive portal. There was a transparent proxy, something like that. But there's only really one way to tell and that's to capture as many packets as you possibly can. So hook up an ether tap to the back of uh, your consumer device, throw it in bridging mode, and make sure all the natting, firewalling, Wi-Fi, and everything is behind the ether tap. That way you've got uh, as close to raw packets as you get without having a, a DOCSIS sniffer, which I'm not investing in. Um, Tool-wise, it's really simple, TCP dump. In fact, two of them, because it's an ether tap and you've got an in and an out which is really good because that makes use of my terrible hardware because then I can run it across two cores, two disks, two buffers, and everything else like that. You also get really useful information using an EtherTap because things are saved into two files, an in file and an out file, so you don't have to infer direction based on things like uh, packet headers. The other thing to remember is we have two states. We have being injected, i.e. when I've used too much bandwidth, and not being injected, and we can force which one we're in by how much bandwidth I've used. That means I can determine whether I'm being intercepted or man in the middle or not, so I can determine what sort of whoops, results I'm getting. So a quick, quick look at the tools. There's a whole bunch more, but basically you're saving in PCAPs and then you're replaying it multiple times through different tools. You've got acquisition tools like TCP dump, Wireshark, wire and T-Shark. Those are just for sniffing the packets off the wire or playing them back on the screen. Uh, the middle row largely are for extracting packets from PCAP files or pushing PCAP files back together. If you're sniffing days worth of data, you're going to have gigs and gigs and gigs, and you don't want to throw gigs and gigs and gigs into Wireshark, trust me. <laughs> you want to extract just a few packets and look at a few seconds at a point in time, so you use those tools to do that. The others are for analysis, things like drawing graphs, measuring round trip times, and that sort of thing. So let's look at the sniffing. I've tried to spare you a TCP dump output on a monitor, on a projector. Uh, this is a normal HTTP request as sniffed when I'm not being intercepted. 
Uh, you've got the three-way handshake, the SYN, SYN, ACK, and ACK, an HTTP request, then the response, which has the header and the data. Then when we get to the point of me being intercepted, i.e. having that banner, we sniff again on the client, on the server, and then compare the two results and look at what's different. So first we send the SYN packet, and that arrives fine. We get the SYN ACK fi back fine, and we get the ACK. That means we've completed the TCP handshake, so that's all gone as expected. Next, I send an HTTP request, but that never arrives at the server. What does arrive is a reset push ACK. That resets the connection at a TCP level from the server's point of view. So it thinks the client has just dropped the connection. Interestingly, normally the client would send a fin packet, but a reset's used because the server sends no reply to that, so there's no hints coming back to the client that something funny's happened. And obviously, I don't know where that came from, although it appeared to come from me. Next, I get a response from the server that never got the message, um, which obviously didn't come from the server. Um, and everything fits in. It's the right sequence numbers, port numbers, TCP flags, all that sort of thing. So what did we get? We got this. And unsurprisingly, it's just the code to throw up the, uh, the banner at the top of the page. It's a bunch of script and frames. But there are a couple of interesting points. The stuff highlighted in red is to make sure it doesn't get cached. That's because it's presenting itself as that web page. And if it gets cached, the real content at the bottom won't be able to load, because when it goes to hit it, it'll pull this again from cache. The other thing to notice is there's no server string. Uh, it's completely compliant with standards, but it's not normal. Um, but I think that's to keep the size down, because this all fits in a single packet, which means no one has to do any complicated session management when they're intercepting. They can just throw this packet at me, and they're done. So this is kind of secondary. I don't really care about the banner a whole lot. But what we can start looking at are packet headers. Uh, you can't mess with packet headers too much when you're injecting, because if you change TCP flags, IP addresses, port, sequence numbers, you suddenly drop out of the session, and you're no longer intercepting that session. So there's, there's not a lot of scope for room. But there are a few things that can change. Uh, TTLs are one. They were sort of lazy, and they use the same TTL uh, every time they inject a packet. That means that most of the time, the TTL isn't going to match the packet from the legitimate SYNAC you got earlier in the transaction. So you can look for a change in the TTLs and spot some injection. Or so I thought. Unfortunately, low balancers do that too. So I flagged up all of Amazon, Netflix, and everyone else. So that kind of sucked. But there were some other things. Uh, they never set the do not fragment bit. That's hardly unique, but it is consistent with every single injected packet. And the window size is always set to 1, which is a lot more unusual. Combine this with the do not fragment, and you've kind of got a fairly unique-ish signature. It's pretty easy to put in TCP dump, so I ran a check, and it seemed to work. Put it in Wireshark 2, because who knows, maybe TCP dump did something weird, but no, that, that worked too. So I put it in snort, so my IDS can tell me every time Rogers throw something on me. Um, I ran it through a 30 million packet test. It had 100% success rate, as far as I could tell, and no false positives, which is a ratio that I'm quite happy with. So, <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call that having an alert. Though I would say, if you think you're subject to nation state spying, don't rely on this as a method. <laughs> it's not good. Um, but that's not really half of it. There, there's a whole lot more. So remember how that page loaded at the bottom? You see how all the images loaded, and it knew on the second time through to allow that page through? Well, if you look, you also notice that, uh, well, look, if you're in this situation, you'll also notice that it never intercepts XML. It never touches an image. It never touches CSS. It only touches HTML pages. That means it has a concept of injectability, I guess, for want of a better word. But it knows pages or URLs that it can inject and those that it cannot. It never broke um, apps that use XML and SOAP and that sort of thing to talk back. So it means that it has some concept of the content. Also, I observed a couple of times that some pages would load instantly with the banner, and some would load with the banner on the second try. The second try ones, I'm guessing, is because when it loaded the first time, it had no idea if it could inject it. It learned that and then injected on the second try. So what about the ones that injected first try? Well, I kind of inferred that maybe they were watching my connection a little earlier than when they were injecting the packets. If you look at a, a, back at this slide again, the decision to inject is made pretty early on. It's made when they block that HTTP request. 
but that is before they know what kind of content is going to come back. That happens here in the HTTP response. Now, you can't rely on file extensions in the URL because everyone knows you can have PHP return a JPEG. So seeing .php on the end, for example, doesn't necessarily mean it's a PHP page. It could be a JPEG, it could be something else. It's this, the content type in the header that you're worried about. That means that there is some prior knowledge of what's going on, which is interesting because that means that uh, they are not just dealing with me during the period at which I'm being intercepted. They have some kind of database of what is an injectable page and what is not an injectable page. So let's profile that. I have a VPS out on the internet and I have my machines at home. I wait till the beginning of the month, so I have no bandwidth against my host. And then I set this up. I rewrite a whole bunch of pages, or all the pages, on a single site to one URL. That means I can make an infinite number of URLs. I visit that, day, that regularly, once a day, a week, a minute, whatever. I visit each page only once, and I take a note of exactly when I visited each of those pages. And then I do it again, uh, but I'm worried that they're indexing it out of band, not sniffing what I'm doing. So I set up zero DNS, uh, I put an etc. hosts file in, and I HT access it. So I'm the only one that can go to the site. So the only way for them to index this site is to sniff my connection to that site. And the spoiler is they sniff the connection to the site. <laughs> as far as my document, it's hardly complex. This is the document I stuck in. <laughs> I put it up on the first try. And actually, this one never got intercepted at all. And then I did this, and it did. Which brings me to another sort of thing. <laughs> they're not just checking IP level. In fact, they're not just checking HTTP level in the protocol. This is actually looking at the document contents. When you think about what's happening in these surveillance age, that's quite a deep level to be going to to inject a banner to buy more bandwidth. Oh, and by the way, uh, the retention time that they go back, because I can, sorry, that's the bit I missed. I go back and revisit each of those documents. I see which one gets injected on the first try, which gets injected on the second. That, far, that way I know how far back the cache goes. It's 30 days, which is ridiculously long when you consider it's just to throw that banner in. So. If people collect personal information about you, Pepita says, you can ask them what it is. So I wrote a letter to Rogers. <laughs> they... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they sent a reply. <laughs> they sent five pages of reply. About four pages of it was, did you know Pepita says this? Yes, I know Pepita says that. The important sentence is, we don't log anything, so we've got nothing to tell you, sorry. I'm just going to leave that where it is. So I thought I would map this network out, just for fun. So I didn't want to send any direct probes to anything, I didn't want to do anything illegal, so I pass stuff between myself and my VPS and see what I can infer. And what do we use? Traceroute, because Traceroute's awesome and old. Um, but Traceroute's highly underestimated. Everyone knows the ICMP or UDP traceroutes, this thing with the, with the reducing or increasing TTLs. But um, it can be anything. It's just an 8-bit header inside the IP header. You can do it on IPsec, on GRE tunnels, on TCP, whatever. So that's great. You, you trace route using everything you can, and then you do it again using TCP on port 80 and find it takes a different route. Therefore, it's going through a different network, presumably for interception. You can see the little timeouts, presumably where an ACL is messing with it or something like that. This is great. You can write the world's shortest and most terrible port scanner where I trace route those two hops to my host on every port possible and see which one's time out. They only intercept 80, though they do block net BIOS and a couple of other things too. I was moving on to the next stage of profiling and then I found they changed the network. But luckily, for the better, because not only did the timeouts not happen, I have different hosts and in fact I have more hosts. The best thing about this is that's more hops, which means more TTL decrements, which means when things appear at the other end, they will have a different, the TTLs will have a different value if it's been intercepted versus if it's not. So I can write an even shorter and more terrible port scanner <laughs> by using fixed TTL scans, observing the results on the other end, although it is still 80, 
but whatever. So which interface do you get when you're trace routing? Well, typically it's this one. But is that because that's where the incoming packet came? Is it because that's where the reply was sent to from? Or is it some other default? Well, the truth is that the RFCs disagree, and so do the implementations of the different vendors. You can get this address often by sending replies back with a source port of 80 and a destination high port from a server on the internet because it thinks that's the reverse packets coming back in again. Or I can send packets to a destination from me, spoofed to be from my server, then my server gets the replies from this interface. It's pretty easy. You just use Scappy. You can craft packets pretty quickly, and you can enumerate all those interfaces. So you can work out what network they're using and where it all sits. So you trace route once, you get this. You trace route again, you get that. You use the Scappy method, and you can map out the IP addresses of all those interfaces. So I could build a net network map. I didn't put the IPs on because it would clutter this up too much. Um, in the scripts they inject, they really helpfully give the IP addresses of their internal and external web server. <laughs> so we can trace route to it and play, place the server on, and you can see the RFC 1918 address, which is the management LAN. But what about that sniffing injection port? Well, that one's sort of easy because they use that fixed TTL all the time. Most OSs use a round number TTL, 32, 64, 128. The TTLs were in the low 120s, so it's probably got 128 as its TTL for the injected packets, and a simple bit of maths means you can just count the hops, which puts it about there, which fits in with the network diagram quite nicely, so I'm going to take that as, as correct. If I really wanted to be thorough, I should have done this. Do the handshake, semi-HTTP request with increasing TTLs, see when the reset packet comes in. But I was lazy, I didn't have time, so I didn't. So let's get back to the topic at hand. What is injecting these packets? Well, we're lucky. That server um, string did not occur in the, uh, in the packet, the initial packet that bounces you off. However, subsequent packets, it is. Hooray! Um, <laughs> although it is actually just Apache and they've just renamed it. Um, so that sounds like a manufacturer. Then when you look in the scripts, they helpfully put a copyright notice and a URL. So that might be a manufacturer too. So we go to their site and we sell products that inject things on web pages for ISPs. So it sounds like we, we're probably, probably on the track. Also on their site is their page they mocked up for Comcast, which is nice. Um, and the interesting bit is the bit that says, hey, we don't just tie this to IP addresses, we tie this to account numbers, you know, just to mess with the whole stealing your identity thing. So why am I bothered? In case I hadn't hinted, the whole data gathering, the correlation, being able to modify my connection in line was kind of annoying me. Uh, this is the EFF slide that they put out when Verizon was doing metadata collection. It was to point out that you don't really need the contents of a conversation to be able to infer a whole ton of things about it. This is about phone calls, not HTTP. But let's just look at HTTP. From a header alone, not the document contents. You've got the URL, so you know what document someone's looking at. You've got their OS, you've got their browser. You've got their cookies, which we know the NSA used to track via ad networks, so that could be potentially useful. You've got the language they're speaking, and the if modified since tells you the last time they went to that page. And that's just the header. So that's, um, that's some fairly useful information. So what could go wrong? Um, my ISP might not be doing anything deliberately uh, malicious. But what if they were coerced by someone? What if they had a rogue member of staff? Um, and they used it to do something worse. Instead of JavaScript for a banner, what if it was JavaScript to drop an exploit? What if it was JavaScript to drop a fla fake Flash update or Java update or something like that? Like you hear of oppressive regimes doing two arrest protesters and that sort of thing all the time. But that won't happen. I mean, it's not like they leave management consoles just kicking around on the internet for people <laughs> to break into, is it? Oh, well, yes, they do. Um, <laughs> to be fair, this one isn't Rogers. Um, but the, uh, the Geo, Geo IP stuff overlap these. This is actually 40 nodes. 20 injection nodes and 20 management nodes, uh, completely open to the internet, 21 in the US, four in Canada, and a bunch all around the rest of the world. Um, and it wasn't so hard to do this because they put that server string in. So I put it in Shodan. <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, <laughs> so I, I, learned, I learned some stuff doing this. Um, 
<laughs> some stuff I didn't want to know. Um, no, I learned some stuff. One thing I was shocked to learn was that the uh, US Patent and Trademark Office is awesome, and I thought it was terrible. Um, but the culture of everyone suing each other for intellectual property rights means everyone patents everything. And Google searched patents, which is also amazing. So I had a little look. I went back to the manufacturer's site, and I thought, what, what information could I get? Well, I could get the information that they patent the bulletin system. That's the name of the system that does the, uh, the injection. So that's good. So we hit Google, and we can go and look, and we can see what sort of patents they have. Here's one for injecting things into consumer routers, or uh, TCP streams in consumer router networks. Here's one that worries me slightly more, because um, this, is, uh, this is part of their ad network. But this isn't just injecting ads. If you look at that, does advertising content exist? Yes, then edit web page. I think that's called stealing ads. <laughs> and switching ads out for, uh, for your own content. So um, the other thing I learned was that I got my own razor out of this. Um, I thought I was onto some huge evil conspiracy. Yeah, thanks to Hanlon for writing the original. I might have slightly plagiarized. Um, yeah, I thought I was getting onto some huge conspiracy somewhere maybe, but it was actually down to legitimate business reasons. Though I'm not saying for a second that I think it's right, because the reasons I outlined a minute ago, I think it's a pretty dangerous thing to still be doing. Um, but, no, but they are doing it. Um, and the other thing I would note is, this isn't just here. When I did that showdown search, this showed up on Bell and Shaw's networks too. I'm sure it shows up on others. They're just the ones that are open to the internet. Not sure whether Bell and Shaw are actually using those or whether they're just sat on the network in the lab or something, but they were there. Um, and, um, and, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. And yeah, so, I, um, I'm not convinced that it's, it's a Roger-specific problem. And the techniques can be reused too, that trace routing. I used it in the UK, uh, where there is a, a filter in place for certain sites. Um, I could observe things being in, uh, intercepted on the way to the Pirate Bay. And then when I was in the States in a hotel, um, everything HTTP permanently went via another network, and I have no idea why. Um, and I dread to think why. Um, but yes, that's really what I have. Uh, I don't think there's time for question. You lot probably all want lunch anyway, but please feel free to stop me. I've got time for questions? Okay, cool. If anyone would like to ask a question, that'd be great. If not, lunch. Yes? Um, no, they're a little shady about that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, they don't put anything online. Um, they have this site that has a very high level we can inject stuff for you. They don't have any user manuals, product specs. Um, I do have a photo of the devices on my laptop that I could maybe show, but that's, that's about it. They don't, they don't put anything up. They used to, it all mysteriously went down, and it's not on archive.org for what that says. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, the, the problem you get, sorry, you get, you get reset files when? I missed the beat. Right, yeah, um, there are some tools, and I have no idea, I haven't researched if they're using them, but there are tools that do things like inject resets into networks when you're using BitTorrent and stuff to try and stop people from uh, file sharing and stuff. I can't remember the name of them, but there are, there are products that do that, so it's possible, yeah. Any others? No? Lunch? Woo! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>